A t-test starts by assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Then it pretends that we repeat your experiment many, many times. For example, maybe you're measuring the height of men and the height of women, and you want to know are men taller or shorter than women. Now, the null hypothesis says that the difference is actually zero. So your experiments should mostly turn up no difference at all. That means that result, that experimental result, occurs with a high frequency. Now, the null hypothesis admits, OK, fine, maybe sometimes you select men who are taller just by random chance, and you select some of the shorter women from the female population just by random chance. So maybe your experiment will show that men are two inches taller. But that's not as common because it's this randomness, right? Or perhaps some experiments would show that men are two inches shorter, says the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis will even admit sometimes the experiment will give you an extreme outlier, like men are four inches taller. But that's very, very rare because it's so, it's so hard to produce that outcome. You would have to just randomly pick all of the tallest men. And similarly, maybe you will randomly pick the shortest men and you would find that the average male height is four inches shorter than women. If we trace over this, we get a bell curve, or if you really want to impress your friends on Saturday night, you can call this a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. The next question we ask is, where's your data? How often would your data occur? Is it right over here, really close to you know the, the highest, most frequent outcome? Is that where your data lies? Does your data lie over here as an outlier? Perhaps you measured the two groups and you found men are four inches taller. Now you could look at the graph and see where four inches taller is. It's right here. But what we do in statistics is we identify outlier regions. Here's an outlier region associated with the p-value of 0.05. These outcomes that I've highlighted, they collectively only occur 5% of the time according to the null hypothesis. Here's an even smaller outlier region. We've got this left tail and this right tail. These outcomes would only occur 2.5% of the time under the null hypothesis. Here is a 0.01 p-value. Those results only occur 1% of the time. Now remember, if your data is highly unlikely according to the null hypothesis, what does that mean? Does the null hypothesis sound like a good theory? No! If the null hypothesis thinks that you got really lucky and you just happened to measure this incredibly rare random result, then that makes the null hypothesis a bad theory. It's simply not plausible. It's too far-fetched. When it comes time for you to perform your t-test, there are two things you have to decide on. The first is your significance level. It's the threshold for acceptable p-values, like a maximum allowable p-value. Maybe you choose 0.05. You don't want to choose a threshold above that. This is really the biggest significance level that you should pick. Or maybe you say, my p-value has to be 0.025, which means that your data has to fall in that smaller outlier region in order to reject the null hypothesis. Or maybe you make the p-value 0.01, which is an even higher standard. Your data has to be in this tiny sliver or else, you know, you can't really reject the null hypothesis. The second thing you need to pick is whether your test will be one-tailed or two-tailed. So if you, you know, if you're not really sure whether men are, are taller or shorter, that would be a two-tailed test. That's a more conservative, a safer bet. If you think, you know, if you have a good reason to suspect men could only be taller, or if you know for a fact men could only be taller, you could choose a one-tailed test, but you want to be careful here. You need a good reason. You need some evidence in order to pick this one-tailed test. Most of the time, we'll be doing two-tailed tests. 
And most of the time, your best bet with the p-value or with the significance level is to choose a maximum p-value of 0.01. When it comes time to perform the actual t-test, there are online sites that can help you do this. Now, the one I'm showing you here, here's the, the URL, this is a really powerful test. It's actually slightly different from a traditional t-test. I mean, it, it gets around certain assumptions that a regular old t-test would require. So for example, a regular t-test means you have to assume that the, uh, you know, the two samples have a normal distribution. You also, with a regular t-test, you have to assume that the two samples have uh, the same standard deviation. This Man Whitney U test gets around those two assumptions. This one is what you use for an unpaired test. You have two independent groups that you tested men and women, Europeans, Americans. If you have one group that you tested twice, you would use potentially this online website, okay? And you would click take me to the calculator. But uh, for many of our experiments, we'll be, testing, we'll be testing two separate groups and evaluating how close their means are or their averages. So here's what you do. You click right here, take me to the calculator, the Man Whitney U calculator. We scroll down and we enter our data into sample one and sample two. And I've actually got some data from Excel here that I'm going to plug in, copy it and paste it. Now I created this data so that it should have a very, very small p-value. Uh, I am going to hold myself to a higher standard. I'll make my p-value, my significance level 0.01. So if I get a p-value of 0.02, I can't reject the null. I'll be conservative. I'll choose two-tailed. This is what we usually do and I click Calculate. And let's scroll down. Here's a z-score, which you can use if you understand how to use those. But also, hey, look at that. What a small p-value. That's incredible. So now I need to click on Calculation Details to pull up some more information. And I can copy and paste this into a Word file. The way we do that is by clicking on the Windows icon. And then you can type Snipping to pull up the Snipping tool. Click here on the snipping tool. This snipping tool allows you to take a screenshot really, really easily. So if I scroll down a little bit, I will click on new, new snip. I highlight the thing that I want to screenshot, which is all of this data here. And then I click edit, copy. I open my Word file and I right click and paste or you hold control on your keyboard and you click V to paste. Next, I go back, here's my snipping tool, let me keep that here. I go back to the uh, web browser. I need to get a screenshot of the stuff on bottom, so I go back to snipping, I click new. And again, I highlight the portion. Hey, it changed my significance level. You would probably fix that before moving forward and you want to make sure you've got the p-value there at the bottom. But again, you know, be sure to change this back to what you actually selected. Uh, next, you can edit copy or control C with your keyboard. Go back into Word and control V or right click paste. And there it is. You can do the same thing with the other uh, calculator. This would be what you use for a, a paired t-test. And the really great thing about this site is it shows you the requirements. And it even gives you a little bit about the formula, or it'll tell you about the assumptions that it makes. If we go back, there's some great information about the requirements. So you can use this and discuss this type of information in your report. You can explain that you used, you chose this test because you had two random independent samples. You know, you, you weren't testing a single group twice. It was two different groups. Um, you can talk about the data being continuous and interval scale if you want to go look that up. Um, and, oh, here's the interval scale. That's, this is a different assumption, con continuity. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of good information here. You can search these terms. You can read online. Uh, there's a world of statistics that we could go into, but 
this is a great tool when you're just trying to uh, you know get a sense of which one to use there are other great articles you know you can just search online and find good information about whether to use a one-tailed test a two-tailed test and uh, the, res the, the resources out there are really spectacular so do a little searching and enjoy thanks for watching